Hello and welcome to Barrel Solutions for Natural Stone Tile in CPD. My name is Alan Garland and I'm the Specifications Manager for the South West. As with our other CPDs in this series, this is a recorded seminar, so unfortunately we can't take any questions or comments during the, the process. If you do have any questions or would like to discuss a live project though, please do call me on the number on this slide or drop me an email. Barrel has a proud history. We were founded in 1962 by the tile manufacturers that constituted the British Ceramic Tile Council. As tiles and materials were changing and there were no specific products or guidance for fitting tiles, the industry was starting to experience installation failures. To ensure tiles could be used successfully and grow as an industry in the UK, the council formed a specialist materials company to develop high quality products for tiling installations and provide a comprehensive technical advisory service for the industry. Bauer was formed for the industry, by the industry, and it's a value intrinsic to all we do today. We have a number of different teams here at Bauer who will be able to aid you at each different stage of the project. The specification team, for example, can deliver any of our eight REBA approved CPDs in practice and also help advise which products to specify. We could even write that M40 or M20 specification for you. Our task team, or technical advisory service team, who are based at our head office in Stoke, are on hand during office hours for market leading technical advice. Now this is all backed up by our technical and training teams who are available for on-site technical advice, as well as systems training for contractors who may have not used the system previously, and things like moisture tests on newly laid screeds. So, key topics for today. We're gonna to go on to look at an introduction to natural stone, some common types of natural stone, understanding adhesives and grouts and how they react and work with natural stone, some main problems and solutions when tiling with natural stone, and also best practice and guidance from industry bodies. An introduction to natural stone. So a stone is considered a tile when it is less than 12 mil thick and it has no edge length greater than 610 mil on any side. Anything above this, we consider it a slab. All stone sold in the UK must be CE marked, and this includes all imported stone. Resin or mesh back stone is not recommended for use when tiling. These backings are often used to strengthen the tile during transport. However, these can impinge on the bonding of stone tiles. In order to use these tiles and the backing on these tiles must be completely removed. A minimum of 75% of the reverse of every tile must be free from bond inhibiting materials. This is so the adhesive can make contact with the tile back. Most home materials with coarser finishes offer better slip resistance. These are ideal for wet areas or areas subject to slipping risks. And some natural stones are porous. These can present problems when using adhesives with water used to mix them and also many are unsuitable for wet areas internal and external. As mentioned on the previous slide, not all stone can be used in wet areas. Those susceptible to water uptake, staining and deform deformability should not be chosen. Epoxy grout should never be used to joint filling between units. Epoxy has very little flexibility and can cause excessive restraint when using natural stone. Acid based materials should always be avoided. Acetoxy curing silicates, for example. Acid based compounds can attack natural stone surfaces and cause long term damage. Natural tiles should always be solidly bedded in adhesives. There should be no voids beneath the tiles. And selecting stone that has a proven track record of success on floors and walls will help to the success of the project. Key differences between ceramic and natural stone. Ceramic, for example, will take days to manufacture. It's a very controlled manufacturing process, which provides a consistent mass supplied product. We have a mixture of raw materials, glazes, and they can be a traditional or textured. They do have a degree of porosity, but then we go to a porcelain tile, which has a lot less porosity than let's say a ceramic tile. These are normally installed by a ceramic tile fixer. Then we move on to natural stone. Natural stone takes millions of years to form. It's saw cut and worked in a quarry or in a factory, and that can lead to size and thickness variations. It's a very random product. So within the same stone, sometimes we can get different colorations, veinings, appearance and texture. There's all of these things within a natural stone that makes it unique. Natural stone is normally installed by a specialist stone installer or in some cases, 
a stonemason. Their knowledge, they take additional precautions and the suitability of each product for each installation is, is really kind of key to making a successful project. People select natural stone because it's unique. Each piece can be different and each piece carries some history lot within it, the very fabric of this planet. Throughout history, stone has been used as a building material and to this day, it still makes a very popular choice as a wall and floor cladding material. It has a timeless natural beauty and is as unique and as varied as all natural things. Some of the strongest and oldest buildings, castles and palaces are built using natural stone. This is because the correct selection can ensure durability for both domestic and commercial applications, internal and external. The aesthetics of natural materials can make otherwise sterile environments appear more appealing and as random and as natural as the materials are, the ranges available are endless. Today's popular choices include granite, limestone, sandstone, marble, slate and travertine. All have varying characteristics and suitability. In this section, we'll be looking at the common types of natural stone. The range of natural stone available is diverse. Common types are travertine, marble, limestone, slate and granite. They all warrant unique considerations when specifying due to their chemical composition, water absorbency, size, thickness and surface texture. Igneous or magma rocks usually subject to melting. Granite contains probably 60% feldspar, which is colour. 30% quartz, which gives it its hardness, and then 10% mica. It's the mica within this stone that leads us to take additional considerations with natural stone due to its tendency to discolour. Sedimentary rocks. We look at limestone, which is formed through a consolidation of sediments, seashells and other minerals, and as a result, each stone will show its own colours and markings. There's often surface pitting on these types of stones. Sandstone is a hard stone that can be particularly porous, and like many stone tiles, it will require specialist treatment to reduce, to reduce the porosity of its surface. Travertine has holes that are formed by the presence and then the erosion of organic materials such as trees, plants and organisms. Detailed guidance on travertine is available from the Stone Federation of Great Britain. Metamorphic rocks, which have been modified by heat and pressure, such as marble, have, often have mineral veining. Some marble tiles can be weak and may have a mesh backing or resin on the reverse of the tile to strengthen them. Such backings need to be checked to ensure that the backing mesh and its water resistant glue does not occupy more than 25% of the area. We have green marble. Now some green marbles, for example, Verde Alpi, have been known to be adversely affected by moisture since they contain clays. Seek technical advice when supplying these as they will probably require special fixing. Slate might be riven or unriven. Riven slate tends to vary in thickness and, as with the uncalibrated stone, the variety in thickness requires consideration for the installation and levelling products that might be required. Some sources of slate may contain oil, which can lead to the initial adhesion being lost as the oil migrates to the tile surface. It's always sensible to do a trial area first. Home stones are machined to create a smooth, even surface and detailed guidance on the travertine is available from the Tile Association as well as the Stone Federation. Limestone is probably the most widely occurring type of natural stone in the UK. The main chemical composition of limestone is calcium carbonate, carbonate or calcite. Calcite is a soft material and therefore careful consideration is required when selecting limestone for flooring, especially for slip and abrasion resistance. This stone can be polished with use and reduction of slip resistance can happen. Limestone is often a base stone for metamorphic rocks such as marble. Now marble is susceptible to staining, so care needs to be taken on the correct selection of adhesive, particularly when laying light coloured and translucent marble. In the purest form, marble is a white stone. However, the presence of other minerals can provide coloured marbles, which may be veined or possess an irregular pattern. Travertine is suitable for internal application only and needs to be carefully considered as its strength may be lower than other stones. The formation of travertine is very slow, hence the tree debris and other dead material contaminates the stone, rots away and leaves voids. As a construction material, slate is typically very durable and will resist severe weathering for many years and rarely exhibits any degradation. 
UK sleet slates are deemed unlikely to delaminate or exhibit efflorescence. Available in blue, grey, light and olive green, silver grey and many different finishes such as natural, sawn, sanded, fine rubbed, flame textured, bush hammered and water jet. Slate is very durable with a high flexural strength, low porosity and this makes it ideal for use on floors. Granite has an interlocking crystal structure that imparts a high strength and low porosity. Granite can be used as a thinner slab than most other types of stone. It comes in a wider variety of colours and grain, grain patterns. So one watch point is to check the origin. Wide source of supply and varying quality makes knowledge of the origin very important. Check the CE marking of the stone. Sandstone is a sedimentary rock which is coarse grained, consisting of a consolidated mass of sand deposited by moving water and wind. Essentially the rock is quartz, the mineral form of silica, with the grains cemented together by either silica, calcium carbonate or iron oxide. The stone has excellent anti-slip properties and maintains its resistance with wear. Although this may be at the expense of abrasion resistance, it's used heavily externally. Sandstone is traditionally used for building and is prevalent in areas where it occurs locally such as Derbyshire, Yorkshire, the North East, Wales and Scotland. Verde Alpi or green marble is considered separately from true marble as the stone is formed from the metamorphosis of rocks other than limestone. The green colour is typically derived from the presence of a dark green mineral hydrated magnesium silicate or serpentine. These minerals are often weak in structure, hence the stone is commonly reinforced by fibre matting glued to the back face. And hence these stones are mainly used as insets to floors and not for tiling the whole floor. Verde Alpi is susceptible to moisture and that can result in it curling. Often these tiles will require a resin based adhesive, for example an epoxy based adhesive conforming to class R1 of the British standards. There's also a risk of exposure to asbestos form when working with this type of material. Agglomerate stone is a natural stone uniformly bound or agglomerated with a binding material such as polyester resins. A high percentage of resin use can affect the performance of the floor tiles, so this can lead to increased sensitivity to moisture and have a higher coefficient of thermal expansion when compared to most types of natural stone. They therefore tend to be susceptible to moisture due to differential moisture expansion and increased thermal expansion on heating and contraction on cooling. As a product of nature, natural stone is, is naturally earth friendly. When you combine all of the above with the fact that natural stone is abundant in nature, you can easily realise why it's such a preferred building material. In addition, most of the quarries of natural stone have been in use for centuries now, and there is still a sufficient amount of stone to serve the world for centuries to come. Adhesives and grouts. Successfully specifying and installing a tiled wall or floor relies on identifying all of the key elements of the installation. These can include substrate, prep, environment and tile type. We'll discuss each of these in more detail during the next few slides. So, commercial or industrial areas. What other stresses will the stone be exposed to? Is there going to be manufacturing chemicals or heavy cleaning processes used? That could change the specification of the stone. Is it a dry or wet area? Identifying the moisture loading or quantities of water along with the time spent where the water is in contact is important. For water sensitive stone, this can be a key factor in specification. Traffic and load. What type of static or dynamic load is inspected? The foot traffic, will there be hard brimmed or pneumatic wheel traffic? What type of damage is that traffic going to cause? So is the stone suitable for that application? Is the floor going to be subject to pressure washing, heavy duty, medium duty or a light duty area? And then finally, exposure to chemicals. Are the cleaning regimes harsh? Are they going to be using any chemicals? Are there any hygiene requirements? This can all affect the type of stone or whether or not you specify stone at all. We must ensure that the substrate or the background is free from debris. It must be clean, sound, dimensionally stable and dry must be appropriate for the conditions and flat and level, ready to take tiling. If the substrate to be tiled is not flat and even, any undulations will be reflected in the tile finish. BS 5385-3 2014 recommends that surface regularity of SR1 when fixing tiles using a tile adhesive. No gap under, underneath a two meter straight edge greater than three mil 
when placed anywhere on the floor. If we talk about tanking, looking at a wet room or a shower, we need to protect the substrate. This is for a number of different things. It can protect the integrity of the building fabric and also protect the room from mold and un unwanted smells. Priming. If the surface of the substrate is porous, then this could affect the success of the adhesion of the tiles. So it's always, always worth priming those substrates. Uncoupling. Now this may be required because of the variation in lateral movement between the tile and the substrates. Check the substrates for the ability to crack. If the substrate to be tiled is not flat and even, any undulations will be reflected in the tile finish. BS 5385-3-2014 recommends that surface regularity of SR1 when fixing tiles using a tile adhesive. No gap under, underneath a 2 metre straight edge greater than 3 mil when placed anywhere on the floor. If we talk about tanking, looking at a wet room or a shower, we need to protect the substrate. This is for a number of different things. It can protect the integrity of the building fabric and also protect the room from mould and un unwanted smells. Priming. If the surface of the substrate is porous, then this could affect the success of the adhesion of the tiles. So it's always, always worth priming those substrates. Uncoupling. Now this may be required because of the variation in lateral movement between the tile and the substrates. Check the substrates for the ability to crack. The first three are not tested for in accordance with the EN 12004 requirements, but are important to the end user and assist in providing an adhesive which is easy to mix and apply with a good working time. This allows for adjustment of pre-bonded tiles within a given time. BS EN 12004-2 has a test to measure for transverse deformation of tile adhesives. This gives us S1 which is deformable and S2 which is highly deformable. Best practice guidance can be found within these documents and it's essential for the use of natural stone. When tiling with natural stone, solid bed fixing should be adopted to achieve 100% bonding at the back of the tiles. Depending on the size of the tile or with formats getting larger, the stone might require back buttering. Spot fixing should never be used when tiling. This will lead to cracking and reduces the bond strength by reducing the percentage of adhesive touching the tile. For floors, a hidden void could lead to tiles cracking under loading, and for walls, insufficient adhesive contact could reduce its capacity to carry the weight of the tiles and cause them to slip or fall. It's advisable to make sure that your specification calls for 100% solid bed fixing, especially in wet areas. When fixing, varying sizes may require varying bed depths. Consider using a thick bed, pourable type adhesive. The recommended drying time for constructional substrates are also an essential element for ensuring the success and longevity of the tiling installation. The specific requirements are laid down in BS 5385 parts 1 to 5, the codes of practice for ceramic and natural stone wall and floor tiling. Here are some examples of new substrates drying times. So some more considerations to think about when specifying natural stone. We've spoken about quite a few of these, but the one we haven't discussed yet is aftercare and sealing. We will discuss this later on in the CPD in more detail. Adequate preparation of the substrate is important for the Gwen tiling. BS 5385 part five gives, gives us guidance on the tolerance of the finished floor level. It should be SR1 or a surface regularity of three mil under a two meter straight edge. When checked with a two meter straight edge with three mil feet at each end, any gap underneath that straight edge between points of contact should not exceed 6mm. Also, the straight edge should not be obstructed by the floor. The maximum deviation between tiled surfaces either side of a grout joint or movement joint should be 1mm for grout joints less than 6mm wide and 2mm for grout joints 6mm wide or greater. So, for uneven floors that do not achieve the SR1 classification, we should consider levelling the floor with a smoothing compound. Now these come in all different shapes and sizes and we have rapid setting pumpable products available. Some of them go up to 80 mil and dry within four hours ready for tiling. For large format uncalibrated stone, consider adhesives which have a pourable nature and can be used in thick bed applications. The underfloor heating in any installation needs to conform and be installed to British standards. It needs to be fully commissioned prior to tiling with no exposed pipework or cracks or damage present. 
uncoupling membranes are recommended for use with all un underfloor heating systems with natural stone. The Stone Federation gives us safe guidelines on this. Suspended timber floors containing water under water fed systems are not suitable for tiling. Heating pipes preclude the installation of noggins and supports. When using natural stone over an underfloor heated screed, the specification in terms of adhesives and grouts calls for a minimum of C2 tile adhesive and a minimum of CG2 grout. It's also worthwhile specifying an uncoupling mat as per the recommendations from the Stone Federation. We'll now show you a couple of tables demonstrating the different thermal expansion rates of different materials. Underfloor heating coefficient of thermal expansion table 1 here shows the coefficient of thermal expansion for a selection of tiles and stone. Using the coefficient of thermal expansion for concrete as a baseline, here are three examples of selected rigid floor finishes with a widely varying coefficient. Group B1B is porcelain tiles, an agglomerate which is a stone, and tiles and slates. Looking at this table of selected common backgrounds and taking into consideration the previous table, it is possible to see that the combination of materials when exposed to thermal effects can expand and contract and have a direct influence on the overall long term success of the tiling installation, in particular where it's exposed to thermal effects. So primers are used for porous substrates, water sensitive substrates and gypsum based substrates. On porous substrates, it regulates the absorption. Water sensitive substrates, it can stop too much water going into the screed and, and damaging that screed. And on gypsum based substrates, it stops a, a, a reaction called ettringite. What this is, where a gypsum based product comes in contact with the wet cement, we get salts growing between the two. Levelers should always be used where we have an uneven surface that is not SR1. An uncoupling mat should always be used in areas with heated background prone to shear stress, cracked substrates, and then substrates with board joints, for example, plywood. Tanking in wet areas should always be specified and used in water sensitive substrate areas, and it also stops water migration into the fabric of the building. Movement joints should always be specified in all tiling installations. There should be perimeter joints, where the tiling abuts columns, curbs, steps, and plant fixed to the base. Doorway thresholds. Stone tiles should be divided into base sizes no greater than 10 by 10 on non-heated screeds. On heated screeds, we should have a maximum of 40 square metres. Edge length no greater than 8 metres. For example, a square or rectangular installation of 5 by 8 metres. Suspended floors means that the base size should be reduced and additional joints are provided over supporting walls or beams. When using natural stone as a wall finish, it's important to consider the weight of the tile versus the background. A 10 mil thick natural stone is equivalent to 30, square meter, per 30 kilos per square metre, sorry. Add on the five, four to five kilos per square metre of the adhesive and grout, and we have between 34 and 35 kilos per square metre on average. As you can see from the table below, tiling onto gypsum plaster or gypsum plasterboard is not okay. That exceeds the weight limit on that substrate. We should also always consider specifying a lightweight tile backer board this can take up to 60 kilos per square metre, depending on the type of thickness of the board. We must always check with the manufacturer. Please note, plywood is no longer recommended in the British standards for wall tiling. So when wall tiling, we need some additional products as well as floor tiling. Looking at primers, for example, we have different types of primers, acrylic, styrene, epoxy based. The most important factor is do not use PVA. This is no longer recommended and it hasn't been for quite a while. It's soluble and it's potentially water sensitive. Tanking in wet areas as well as the floor. If it is a wet area, we need to tank. We need to make sure that we're protecting the background and stopping any water migration into the fabric of the building. So when we're wall tiling with a natural stone over 12 mil thick, we must use mechanical fixings. Now this can either be internal or external. For all tiling, mechanical fixings are required at heights above three meters. But when we're looking at weight versus height, if we have a particularly heavy product, we might also need to mechanically fix that product. There must be no cavities in wet areas. So when we're using mechanical fixings in, say, a wet area, we also need to use a solidly bedded method. As with the floor, we must include movement joints at wall, in wall tiling. 
They can be over existing or structural movement joints, abutments with other surfaces, such as where two walls meet at a right angle, three to 4.5 meters horizontally and vertically, and those joints should be at least six mil wide through the tiles and the bedding. Structural movement joints should also be extended through the intermediate substrates and be the same width or greater than those joints. Best practice guidance can be found in the British standards and the codes of practice as listed on this slide. Ensure that your contractors are aware of the health and safety and CDM requirements when installing natural stone, particularly the regulations around lifting, cutting, PPE and site safety. For example, the installer may need to use specialist lifting equipment if that natural stone is heavy. So we'll now look at the risk of staining and how it's a common issue with natural stone installations whilst in use. It's important to focus on the solutions available to prevent it from happening. Dirt trapped in the surface of the stone, if not removed, can become stubborn to remove and may require specialist cleaning materials. Similarly, the use of high pressure cleaners, including steam mops, can also cause the tile or slab to discolour. Light coloured and absorbent stone can be stained or darkened by some bedding or jointed material. It may show through even more if the stone is not installed with the correct fixing method, and we'll come on to this a little bit later. Some very absorbent stones may be susceptible to the drawing in of residual moisture from the tile adhesive. This creates either moisture staining or minerals becoming released in the stone by rising moisture from the adhesive or screed beneath the tile or from the grout joints. Lighter staining of the stone can be caused by calcium hydroxide from the mortar reacting with carbon dioxide and water to form calcium carbonate. For most natural stone, in particular carbonate based stones, so marble, travertine or limestone, it's advisable to select a rapid setting white adhesive with a relatively low water demand. This is to prevent the risk of staining caused when moisture from traditional tile adhesives and grouts is absorbed into the stone and creating a watermark or stain. In addition, the presence of excessive moisture within other adhesive types can react with minerals such as iron oxides or organic deposits. This can also discolour the face of the tile. There are trusted rapid setting flexible adhesives which have a low or very low water demand. They will retain the majority of the water used in the mix, avoiding residual water being released. Relatively low water demand rapid setting pourable adhesives can also be applied at a bed thickness up to 25 mil. These are ideal for uncalibrated stone. When grouting natural stone, it's important to consider the water absorption levels of the stone. In order to minimise any risk of possible picture framing, where the edges of the tiles are stained by the water from the grout penetrating the surface, we must specify a rapid setting grout. Depending on the substrate and the service condition, a flexible grout might be required. We can either use the built-in admix version or a two-part powder and admix version. As a general guide, the colour of the grout should complement the colour of the stone tiles and not significantly contrast to avoid the risk of staining. So on to slip resistance. So as we went through the associated problems with natural stone installation earlier, we know that natural stone is prone to the risk of staining. Therefore, protection and aftercare should be considered when fixing natural stone. A few watch points to look out for during the process of fixing natural stone would be that the flooring contractor should be the only one have to have access to that floor. Rapid setting adhesives allow 24 hours before light foot traffic in and 14 days for heavy foot traffic in. The floor should be kept dry and clean and free from any kind of droppings, be it cement or plaster. And to do this, we should protect them with sheets or boards to cover the floor and ensure a good finish. There are various types of sealants or protective sealers available for the use with natural stone. Different stones may require different treatments and some treatments will only be effective against certain types of stain. Seek further advice from either a stone producer or the manufacturer of a propriety sealer. Alternatively, contact the Stone Federation of Great Britain. 
With natural stone, care should be given to the cleaning and maintenance regimes. Further guidance can be found in the British Standards, so BS 5385 Part 5, Section 14, the TTA document, Cleaning and Maintenance of Wall and Floor Tiles, and the Stone Federation's document, Natural Stone Flooring, which is a code of practice for the design and installation of internal flooring. We'd now like to talk you through some case studies. The two-year refurbishment of the centre included revamping shopfronts, installing new energy-efficient LED lighting systems and the installation of granite flooring throughout. Installation of water-sensitive granite in the two-storey centre required a comprehensive specification including rapid-drying white adhesives, quick-drying grouts, primers and levellers. The first three are not tested for in accordance with the EN 12004 requirements, but are important to the end user and assist in providing an adhesive which is easy to mix and apply with a good working time. This allows for adjustment of pre-bonded tiles within a given time. BSEN 12004-2 has a test to measure for transverse deformation of tile adhesives. This gives us S1 which is deformable and S2 which is highly deformable. Thank you for your time and if you do have any questions or would like to talk about an upcoming project or perhaps a live project, please do not hesitate to get in touch using the information at the beginning of this video.